Is it there? One already. Happy days. Thank you, kind sir, for joining us at the start. So, closed distillery series part two. Beard's not looking great today. Um, one of these distilleries, it turns out, I've already tried. I just forgot about. Uh, that's the Cappadonic distillery. That's the first distillery we're going to talk about. Um, it's got a bit of an unusual past, to say the least. So, it's not got a particularly great reputation in terms of flavour either. I have tried one before. It was a, I think it was a 13 or an 11 year old. I'm going to say an 11 year old. Uh, Gordon McPhail bottling at 46%. Um, I do have the official notes just here. Always keep a notes of what you try. Um, <clears throat> overall, not particularly impressive. It was something that was um, just kind of passed me by in a few different ways. It wasn't something that kind of blew me away to a massive degree. Um, with the verdict of it being, uh, it's all right. It's similar in style to Rosebank, worthy enough, without being triple distilled. Um, but it's further north. Wouldn't buy it, but it's nice to try. So that was my overall view on Cappadonic uh, a couple of years ago, because this notebook's from about three or four years ago. Uh, but as a distillery, it was started in 1897, and it only ran until 1902. Uh, and originally it was called Glen Grant No. 2. And very famously, there used to be a, a metal pipe that ran across from Glen Grant over the road to Cappadonic, uh, so that the distillate from Cappadonic would run into Glen Grant um, whiskey was deemed as not particularly of the quality they wanted so they they just abandoned it and they closed the doors in 1902 uh, they remained shut until 1965 and then when it reopened it was given the name Cappadonic so a little bit unusual uh, and it ran until 2002 so it was closed for a particularly long time and then from 2002 to 2010 it produced some whiskey and then in 2010 it was officially closed and demolished um, nothing is really there anymore. Um, I've just seen the notes. It was a 13-year-old Capadonic that I tried a couple of yeah. years ago. And, yeah, it wasn't that impressive. But what we're trying today... <coughs> excuse me. It's from that boutique whiskey company. I think it focuses when I put it over here. It is a 23-year-old, 46.7%, uh, batch number six. So even though Capadonic has a little bit of an unusual history, it's been, it was closed for a very long time, um, there's a lot of it around, because I think it was it was used for blending more than anything. So as a result, it's not the most... Hello, Etienne. It's not the most difficult, rare whiskey to get hold of in regards to things, you know, like uh, Ben Wivis or Killylock or Kill Locky, sorry. Um, St. Magdalene bottlings, bottlings are becoming more difficult to get hold of, and I was looking at the prices of Rosebanks today, and they're just doing that. It's insane, especially the old Flora and Fauna one. Um, so Capadonic, originally called Glen Grant No. 2. I should do that, really, shouldn't I? That's swearing. Uh, closed in 1902. Reopened. Hey, Sam. Reopened in 1965. Ran until 2002. Um, and then was pretty much kind of done by 2010. And wasn't called Capadonic until 1965. Prior to that, for the 60 years it was shut, it was just called Glen Grant No. 2. Um so yeah, it's a it's a Speyside style. There's a lot of closed Speyside distilleries, as we mentioned briefly last week. Such a dense area. Things were chopping and changing constantly. Whiskey's never gone through, apart from sort of the last 30 years, the most consistent time in its life. Prior to that, open, closed, variations. This was shut, that was open, etc, etc. Um, but I've got promise with Boutique Whiskey Company because they've got all really cool stuff. I've tried Highland Parks and Scappers and all kinds of things from them, and they've always been very, very good. Um, but here's the Capadonic in glass. It's been poured for quite a while, actually. It's been in glass for about an hour. I really just wanted to air it out because this sample arrived after last week's one finished. And then we've also got the Glen Uri to talk about as well. I'm quite excited about this. There's not loads to talk about in terms of history, but it's just a. am quite excited to try whiskey I've never tried before. Nothing from that distillery at all. Um, but my past views of Capadonic were that it was okay. Um... I know not everyone is a huge fan of Jim Murray, but I got this book as a gift a couple of years ago for a birthday um, from a housemate. Um, or this sticker, that's just a local restaurant. But it's called The Complete Book Whiskey, and it's written by Jim Murray. As a whiskey journalist and as a whiskey writer, he's excellent. Um, I might not agree on all of his views, um, but he says that Capadonic just suffered from being something that was 
kind of boring. And it turns out that me and Jim have similar views on distilleries like Capodonic, Fetican and Tormor. Um, tried numerous examples from them and they've never really set my world on fire. Um, hopefully this might change that. Beautiful light colour. I think I got the ABV wrong. I think I said 46.3. It's actually 47.8. Whether or not that's cash strength, unaware. It's not a single cask, it's a batch bottling. So we can only make you know, maybe five, six casks worth of it. Maybe even less gone into that. But it's a beautiful light colour. Ideal for a day like today. The weather is beautiful. Smell. According to Jim's notes, and the man does have a good nose, it's uh, it's Capodonic should always have this distinct pine quality to it, like a minty pininess. I'm getting loads of that off this. It's actually, the alcohol's actually quite intense. I'll be honest, I wasn't expecting it to be like that. Um, this isn't my first whiskey of the day. I did have a little kind of palate warmer up before. Um, it does hold the glass wonderfully well. On this camera, you're really not going to be able to see it, but it is... A very kind of thick liquid. The booze is quite prickly. It's quite sp it's quite spicy. It's kind of difficult to get anything out of that. It's a bit lemony. It's a bit citrusy. Getting quite a lot of the malted barley. A nice creaminess kind of comes through with it. And almost like a pear drop icing sugar kind of note. But at 23 years old, um, 10 years older than the previous Capodonic I've tried, I'm expecting good things. So not loads on the nose. It's, the alcohol is a little bit abrasive. Um, according to some other research that I've been, I've been putting together, even when this thing's stuck in like first fill sherry casks, it wasn't particularly impressive. Um, that's a, a few sort of numerous uh, well-respected whiskey writers and reviewers have said that. So... Probably not a contender for the greatest spirit in the world. In their minds, they probably weren't doing anything wrong, but it's just not everyone's cup of tea. So, let's stop messing around. We're only seven minutes in. Let's taste it. Ooh, <clears throat> okay. One similar thing that is doing to the 13-year-old I tried a couple of years ago. There was a note in my old book which said, the longer you hold it, the more intense this whiskey becomes. That was the same at 46% as it is at 47.8. For the first sort of 10 seconds of that, it was very soft. Like, really soft. Quite underwhelming. Got a slight herbalness from it. Very Balblair Highlandness going on but the rest of it was kind of here and there really it was a little bit as far as like a, a, a flavor goes but then just before i was about to swallow it the spice really amped up it got very peppery it got very kept ceasing jalapeno side of the tongue spice i do wonder if that's changed the smell oh, a little bit actually um it's got a kind of minerally element to it now Hello Jason, nice to have you here. Thank you to the eight of you who are watching. I'm sure you've probably got better things to do your afternoon. But thankfully you're here. So you have to taste it now, it's got like a um, minerally limestone, mossy kind of feel to it. Um, quite unusual considering at the start it, it smelt of nothing at all. I don't remember how much this sample was, unfortunately. It's still on the, the Master of Malt website. Um, I don't think it was that expensive. I think it was about sort of 17, 18 pounds. It wasn't as expensive as the Glen, Glen not Glenesque. Uh, I've ordered another sample from Master Malt, but we'll leave that for a surprise. It wasn't as expensive as the other sample that I've ordered from Master Malt is. Um, but if you, if you do want to try Capodonic, even if you don't particularly like it, it's quite a nice way to do it because a full size bottle. Um, I think at one point in the shop I work in, we had a 21-year-old, which was about £260. Which, as it was a single cast too, so in the grand scheme, that's not a bad price for a single cast closed distillery. It's actually quite good. On the younger side, at 21. 
um, but cash strength and all that good stuff. And the other one was a 40 year old, same deal, single cask, etc. Uh, I think that was about 600, which again, it's not bad for a 40 year old closed distillery. Um, but you know, those are quite expensive things to buy if you don't like that style. So by all means, if you just go and check this out, uh, you'll see what you see if you think it's if you want to buy it. There was two samples on there. One was a tenner cheaper a bottle. I think this was like two hundred and fifty pounds a bottle. Drinking whiskey and dr drinking whiskey reviews. Mm. It's not a bad way to spend a very sunny Wednesday afternoon. Even though this has been in the glass for about an hour, it's getting better now. Obviously, taste is a very important part of smelling in general. The two do work together in a big way. It's opening up now, it's got like a powdery quality to it. You could describe it as chalky, which fits in with that nice mineral element. Jason, I'm trying to track down a bottle of Imperial. And I won some stuff on uh, Scotch Whiskey Auctions, not last night, but the, the day before when it closed, on Monday night. Um, smaller samples, two of them closed distilleries from Banff and Milburn. So I'll be trying those quite soon. Um, but... I really, really want some Imperial because I've heard good things and I tried a, I think it was like a 96 Gordon McPhail bottling in the pot still in Glasgow a couple of years ago and it was incredible. It was, it was really good. Um, but if fine drams have some, I'll check that out because we need Imperial because it needs to be checked off the list. Um, the channel has reviewed Little Mill and Rosebank in the past and we'll still be doing all of it. So even if we've done a, a full video, a full production video on one of these products, or one of these distilleries, I should say, we'll be doing it again. Um, because we don't know how long this quarantine thing's going to last, and even if it does end sooner rather than later, um, we'll still continue this series, and I'll probably still do it like this, because it's quite nice. Rosebank is the one I'd love to get my hands on. I've tried a few Rosebanks, and they've never impressed me. Um, but obviously that's just my personal opinion. If you like that style, go out for him. I know Roy Aquavite loves Rosebank. Uh, a few other sort of well-respected folks in here too love Rosebank. Uh, you can get some good samples. I think Whiskey Exchange have a sample of like a 21 or a 25-year-old. It's about £70 for 3CL, uh, which is a lot. Um, but by means, if you want to track one down, feel free to. Because these things have to be drank. They've got to be enjoyed. You can see why something like this would take prior priority in a blended style. It adds some oiliness. It adds some nice richness. Flavour-wise, it sits on that greener... Not coastal, because it's not salty. But it sits on that greener, herbier... Highland style. Like It reminds me quite a lot of, um, sort of past versions of our Blairs, like the 2005. It's got that very much going on but with a slightly more stunted nose um not as fruity either i wasn't going to actually add any water to this um i'm going to run on the basis i think it is cash strength it's probably not the most solid basis i've ever ran this thing on but if we do have just a little bit of water just to see if it changes um because we will be doing that with the glen uri because that comes in at 61 percent abv and i'm not really fancy and burning my mouth at this uh stage in the evening Tried a sample of Rosebank 21 and loved it. Was that the official Diageo release? Because that's the one I tried a couple of years ago. And I would like to retry it again. Because when I tried it, I wasn't as good as I am now. For want of a less egotistical phrase. Um, and the only Rosebank I have tried was a 12-year-old, which was bottled at 40%. Which I just didn't get on with, because I think it just didn't do anything. It was quite, pretty flat. Ah, so yeah, we tried it from the same bottle, the one Matt had. Yeah, and I think he's still... No, he finished it the other week, actually. He's, it's now gone and it's sale of Eid. But I'll retry Rosebank. We're going to get a sample in anyway, so my opinion may have changed because I discovered Glen Flagler I loved last week. I think that was really that was really good Lowland whiskey. I like Daff Mill. I like Eden Mill. Um, I like King's Barnes. So Lowland whiskey is growing on me because it's not just two people anymore. Elsa Bay is great as well. Very different style, but obviously lovely. 
cool. So a bit of water's made this really whiny now. Um, my Pinot Grigio, quite dry, still a bit minerally. But more apple, more pear, more kind of classic space side notes, not the herbal style it has. Swami! Swami's in. It's morning for him, it's sort of late afternoon for me, it's uh, quarter past seven. But yeah, with water, this thing's actually got better and bigger and much more interesting. Water took the oil away. The texture's not there anymore. And it took a lot, it took pretty much all the spice away. So it made it more fragrant, but it killed a lot of the stuff that made the style interesting for blending. Um, but just to recap on the Capadonic. 23 year old from Boutique Whiskey Company at 47.8%. Uh, so started in 1897 by the boys that ran Glen Grant. Was literally opened over the road and named Glen Grant number two. And a metal pipe went across the street from Capadonic to Glen Grant to send the distillate there. Uh, only lived for five years. It closed in 1902 and then it wasn't open again until 1965 that was when it was actually called capadonic that's when the name came in and then it ran until 2002 um producing whiskey making whiskey in a very typical manner and then in 2010 its doors officially closed and the place was demolished so it doesn't do anything anymore um from the abundance of bottlings that have been made and of all the closed distilleries um capadonic is something that you do see a lot of I can, I can only imagine when it was running from, you know, sort of 2002 to 2010. It's 2 p.m., but it's cracked by the clock in there. Yeah, yeah. Every, this whole thing is kind of screwing with people's sleeping patterns and everything. I played on, on the PlayStation for an entire week last week, minus that live stream. And my eyes, after seven days of it, were just like... I'd, I've literally taken a week off because I, I looked like a crackhead, so... I've not started drinking at 9am yet, so that's an important thing, although that could change. But finishing what I was saying, um, when it was reopened from 65 all the way up until about 2009, well pretty much 2010, it, they must have produced a lot of whiskey, because it is, it is one of the easier closed distilleries to get hold of, um, and it doesn't normally run that expensive, sort of like anywhere between about 250 um, to as I said, we used to sell a 40 year old for £600, which in the grand scheme of 40 year olds currently isn't that bad at all if you want to spend that much money. And the fact it was a closed distillery too was kind of an, an added bonus for that price. Now I'm quite excited about this one. So Glen Uri Royal. Glen, spelled the classic way, Uri, U R Y, Royal. Now from the history that I've tried to track of this thing. Um, it didn't actually have a royal seal. <clears throat> Unlike Lafroig, uh, Royal Lotnagar, Johnny Walker, it never actually received a royal seal from anybody. So why it has royal in the name is a little bit unknowing to me. This, I believe, is the old, the only like full sherry um, closed distillery we've had yet. I might be able to get all of some more. This hasn't been opened at all, so I'm just going to let it sit there a bit as we run through some statistics and we run through this cool little fact card that Cheaper by the Dram send when you buy one of these samples from them. Um, it's just a crib sheet. So Glen Uri Royal Distillery. This is the Highland region. It is bottled by Diageo and it was bottled as part of the Rare Malts series. And they were these cool bottlings of like blue bottles with gold labels. And it was every distillery <coughs> that the company owned at the time. And it was done in the 80s, or was it the early 90s? It was the early 90s, because this was bottled in 94. Um, just to kind of showcase all these cool things they had. And sadly, most of them don't exist anymore. Brewer was in there, Port Ellen, Glen Uri, Glen Esk, but it's bottled as Hillside, uh, Rosebank, all the good stuff. It was all in there. Uh, so it's owned by Diageo. It is a single malt scotch whiskey, 23 years old, distilled 1971 and bottled 1994, 61% ABV. Um, of all the bottles produced, this was bottle number 3349. Um, I've actually never seen any of these bottles in the flesh. I've never tried any of them. 
despite trying poor Ellen and everything. Hello, Tony. Nice to have you in. Uh, so this is going to be quite exciting. And as far as the distillery goes, I'm just going to put that card over the glass. Um, <clears throat> pardon me for looking off. I've just got some notes here. I'm trying to condense everything for you guys. Uh, so founded in 1825. It is argued that it either closed in 1983 or 1985. Um, that is literally quite a debated topic. And there's many forums dedicated to arguing when this thing closed. We can essentially go with either one, because um, it did actually produce whiskey up until 1992. It was mothballed in the early to mid 80s, um, but it continued to produce whiskey all the way up until my year of birth in 1982. So it was established in 1825. The guy who founded it was a bit of a weird fella. Um, if This is one of the strangest and probably most pointless facts I've ever seen or heard of. If you go into the Wikipedia page or the Scotch, or is it the Scotch, ScotchWhiskey.com? If you go into either one of those and just type in Glen Uri Royal, the gentleman who founded it was the first man to walk a thousand miles in a thousand hours. So he walked at one mile an hour for a thousand miles. Not the greatest achievement. We can only hope that his whiskey was better distilled than that. Although when this was distilled, he wouldn't have been alive. Um, so, you know, a thousand miles in a thousand hours. Good for you. Um, then the argument of whether it closed in 83 or 85 had a pretty... Typical past, quite unknowing. Um, hi, Daniel. Nice to have you in, too. We're getting to nine. I've got ten people in now. Might be a record for me. Um, in 68, they stopped malting their own barley. 83, 85, the place was mothballed. And then whiskey production itself ceased in 1992. So for 28 years, they've not produced whiskey. Um, I believe the place now... Hello, Mark. Mark is in. Mark runs cheaper by the drums. Uh, so great timing. As he, we get onto his product, or his sample, I should say. Um, and then production fully stopped in the early 90s. So I've never seen a bottle of it in the flesh. This is the only chance I've had or seen to literally get hold of it, because this bottle goes for about £900 plus. Um, I think one of them actually finished on Scotch Whiskey Auctions last night for the same price. Not last night, on Monday night. So 61%. An unusual Highland, a wonderful colour, like a, a stunning example of heavily sherry influenced whiskey. Very iron brew like in its colour. And again, my camera's not that good, so you guys won't see it, but it is sticking to the glass in a lovely way. Nose is big, a lot of ABV, but under it is just tons of honey. Robert from Canada. Hello from Manchester, Robert. Nice to have you in. Loads of honey. <clears throat> Slightly medicinal. It's got like a cowpole. Sort of like artificial strawberry note going on. It's a bit rubbery. Iron brew is a good description. It does look like iron brew. It's got that really intense orangeness about it. Loads of honey. Kind of artificially sugary notes. Um, Jim. The G Jim Murray who, you know, divides people. Uh, from the book I read on him on and him reviewing this whiskey, he said that the younger examples were more vibrant, they were more fresh. Uh, the older stuff was a little bit over-oaked. We don't have the two to compare. I, I highly doubt that we'll ever get to try any Glen Uri Royal that's 10 years old. If any bottles that do exist, they are locked in safes, I'd imagine. Um, but this is, this is very interesting. There's a slight smokiness to it. And I mentioned rubber, smelling like it before. Um, bar meets mark it doesn't have to be something fancy just something to make it go a little bit nicer in the evening Alex is in too Does, you can't see Alex because you don't know what his face looks like but Alex works with me on our day to day sort of work life when we're not in a pandemic so it's nice to have Alex in as well but yeah honey it's a little bit smoky but very subtle Smoke, like take Talisker, but kind of just compress it down. And then there's these herby artificial sugar notes in there that are like strawberry, that are like raspberry. A tartness, you could maybe say. But it, it smells very rich and indulgent and thick. 
It is 61%, so I'm only going to take the little bits. And then we'll see what the verdict on Glen Uri is. As you'd imagine, it is quite spicy. In terms of just spice, it's quite similar to an Octomore. And it lasts for a very long time. It really kind of dances and fizzes away on the, on the very back of your tongue. In terms of the front of the palette, there's not much there. I'm just going to leave that there so you guys can actually see the colour on that. Will that balance? Hopefully it will. <coughs> Spice wise, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I've not caught anything. I think I've just eaten something a bit too intense today. <coughs> That's better. Now, still being able to taste it now, as you should with older cash drink whiskies in general, just in terms of the oak influence and the level of spiciness and that slight bit of smoke, it is kind of Octomore like in its run. I guarantee that's not how the original style of bottlings would have come across. They probably would have been softer, maybe slightly smokier. Those richer indulgent notes of things like honey and the strawberry thing really go away. It becomes a much more herbal, forward, highland whiskey. Um, herbalness and herbally flavour seems to be the tone of this tasting. Capadonic had it in bucket loads and this glenory has got it too. We are just going to let it sit there for a bit longer and kind of indulge itself in the light. Um, of the 12 of you that are wonderfully watching this uh, live stream, have any of you tried? I know we um, Jason said before that he's tried Rosebanks and Etienne said that he's tried Rosebanks and last week we did a little bit of a, a gamble on what we you guys would like me to do. St Magdalene came top of that list. Um, like I say, I've managed to get hold of a Milburn sample, which I thought was going to be impossible, and a Banff sample too. Um, I've looked at Banff in a cabinet for years but never tried it. So that should hopefully be next week. Um, there's some Glen Oogie on the way as well. Um, so we're kind of covering all the closed Glens, which is nice because they were quite easy to get hold of. Um, I can get a St. Magdalene sample. That will be coming within the next two weeks. I hopefully can get hold of a Lockside sample, so a closed grain distillery. Um, typically, I'm actually doing grain distilleries on this, but if I can get them, I will. So like Port Dundas, Canvas, everything like that. Um, Oh, sorry. Yeah, I got that wrong, Jason. Sorry. Uh, Jason's tried Imperial and Brora. He wants to try Rosebank. My mistake. I apologise. Um, Imperial, we need to get hold of. Uh, Brora, I'm going to try and put some feelers out there, because I know some people who've got open bottles of it. But it involves some heavy trades, I'm sure. Um, so We're getting there. Um, but by means, if you have any sort of recommendations in, in, in the comments section of anything you'd like to see me try that isn't the St. Magdalene... Um, the list is on my phone again, so I sadly can't pull it out. But I do have this trusty book, as always. So just while that gets a little bit more air, because the Capadonic was in the glass for a very long time, um, we will obviously be getting the big three. The big three being Brewer, Rosebank and Port Ellen. But in the midst of all that, <clears throat> I'll leave out the ones that we have already tried. And so uh, Bam's coming in. We know that's going to happen. Um, Glen Withis, it turns out to be like the shortest lived distillery of all time. It started in 1965 and only ran until 1976. I thought Pity Vake was the shortest run ever. Um, but Glen Withis only produced whiskey for 11 years. So that might be quite hard to get hold of, but that is kind of top of my radar. Because if I can get hold of that, we'll do it. <clears throat> Capadonic we've done. Uh, Colburn, I think we can get hold of some of that. Convalmore. We can get some of that. Dallas Dew is actually quite hard, easy to get. Um, I might actually just fork out and get a full bottle of it because apparently it's quite nice. Uh, Glen Albin, we're still yet to try. Uh, Glen Lockie, Glen Moore. I think I can get some Glen Moore. Glen Uri is in the glass. Imperial, Inverleven, Killy Lock. Discussed that last week. That's going to be an absolute mission to try and get, but I will try my damnedest. Uh, King Claith, Ladyburn. Little Mill, I reviewed the official 12-year-old 
years ago when I used to do Whiskey Wednesday just like this and put it out every week. We did uh, the Little Mill 12 year old. Wasn't impressed with it, um, but we will retry. Uh, Lockside, Milburn's on the way, Northport, Pity Vake, uh, St. Magdalen, you guys wanted to try. Uh, Northport and Colburn, the two that are on my list, just because I've never seen them in the flesh. Um, but if you have any recommendations that you want the next video to be on, tell me and we'll source the sample. Um, I'm lucky in this current situation to have some spare cash, which is quite nice because I'm not buying breakfast, lunch and dinner at work every day as I normally would. So there's a little bit of spare cash left and we can use that to buy some cool samples. So let's go back to this. Has it changed? Has it developed? It's getting kind of salted caramel, really dark chocolate notes on now. This is actually the coolest sample we've been able to do, along with the Glen Flagler and actually the Glen Esque. So the Capadonic's the only obscure one because it was a it's an independent bottling uh, and it's batched. Whereas the Glen Esque was an official bottling from the 80s, the Glen Flagler was an official bottling from the 70s, and this was an official bottling by Diageo. And official bottlings are going to give us a better insight as to distillery character. Um, comparing the two Capadonics has been quite good because they taste quite similar. The one that I've tried a couple of years ago and then the one we've just tried today. <clears throat> um, the Milburn is an official bottling. The Banff is an official bottling. So that's great. We can make sure we get those nailed down. Um, but if Glen Uri in general smelt like this when it was normally produced, I can't see why they close it down because it's got a very Highland Park meets slight Talisker meets almost Glendronic quality about it. It really pulls you in. It's very rich. It's probably one of the richest whiskies I've smelled in a long time. Just like honey, salted caramel, a little bit of smoke, dark chocolate. No citrus, like no fruits, nothing like that. So the sherry casks which are in this are having quite a big influence. Add a bit of water. Took me by surprise a bit then. Um, and the finish is the same as it was before. It's big. It's herbal. It is similar ABV to an Octomore. So you can see why I'd compare the two. <clears throat> the smoke is nowhere near the amount an Octomore would have. But in general, I don't tend to find Octomores that smoky. I think it's a note that doesn't really... They, they've always just smelled like barbecue sauce to me. Um, kind of rich and sweet. Smoke and Noctimore for me is like third or fourth on the list of things you taste. It's not really at the front. So the bit of water, it hasn't changed the, the colour that much. Texturally, there's none of that kind of scotch mist in there. Smell-wise, it's quietened down, which is a shame. Because I do love the smell of this thing when it's not got water in it. Now it's becoming a bit more typical. It's become almost like very abalor in what it does. A bit of raisin, the fruit stuff's coming through now. Melons, grapefruits, dry citrus skins, things like that. Still hits though. I probably only added uh, about half a teaspoon of water to that. And the smoke is still in there. Just a, a little fragrant flutter of smoke mm. so the taste now with water is what the nose was before so those honey caramelly chocolatey notes with water have now transferred onto the palate <clears throat> The spice has gone away and it's now just become this richer feeling, less intense, but like dark coffee, like espresso, bitter coffee and chocolate, which I love. Um, I've only recently, I, say I, can't, I need to stop saying that because it's been nearly two years now, but two years is quite a, at the age of 20, 
nearly 28 to get into coffee in your late 20s i think is quite unusual especially now um so i'm, I'm kind of new to this whole coffee thing and the more i drink coffee the more intense i prefer it um so, you know little milk or no milk no sugar really chasing down like different styles and flavors that i enjoy and that on the nose without water this whiskey was loaded with it added water the intensity of the nose goes away it just is replaced by some classic sherry notes but the intensity of no water on the nose transfers to the palate when there is water added to the whiskey i probably could have said that sentence in a much easier way but i've chosen not to um but yeah bitter coffee bitter dark chocolate really heavily burnt caramel caramelized things um delicious um mark is still in in the chat so if you do have any questions for him about cheaper by the dram um this is the second bottle of theirs we featured on this little series of ours glenn Fa uh, glenn flaglet in the last video glenn erie royal in this one i quite like these little baseball cards you get with it too i keep all of these they're really useful bookmarks and they're a useful thing to have as references too so wow, i did try that many years ago um some cool bottles on there at the minute there's a hillside on there there's some glenuri samples left um some cool lafroigs i'm pretty sure there's still some optimal 1.1 so if you're optimal fans there's some 1.1 samples on his on his website um so go and check it out because it's really cool um we've probably got about 10 minutes left um i am just gonna let that sit there and just mature in its watered state but something that's been getting on my nerves a little bit at the minute being at home all the time now um i went for a walk today um i tend to go for a, you know a walk at least once a day um probably gonna stop that in the next couple of days because i think uh, the pandemic in the uk i think it reaches its peak tomorrow um which is a dangerous time for this kind of thing um so i probably won't be going out in the next couple of days i'll probably just be staying in <clears throat> but as a result of staying in i've been drinking much more whiskey not in a bad way but in just a trying stuff way um so before we finish this uh, video out with the final sample of that glen uri um i'm gonna pull this thing up and i just want to get people's opinions on it i have these at home and i've not been able to use them for a long time because the house i previously lived in i didn't like that house um it made me not feel great as a person it was really kind of depressing going home to that house all the time just because it was big and it was cold and only two of us lived there and there wasn't much to do and these things were in storage for a long time i've got two i've got this one which is a royal dalton one it was a christmas present many years ago with six of these very nice glasses um makes a wonderful sound when you crack it open and i've got this one which i believe was my granddad's let's move move that out of the way apologies for that noise if it hurt your ears and we've got this one which I, I think was my granddad's um i found it in the back of my mum's kind of glassware cabinet about four or five years ago um not the rarest thing these are quite easy to, to find so i don't think it's got any sort of weird value to it at all but <clears throat> i've been using these a lot more drinking from them a lot more and i have to say i'm enjoying the experience of drinking whiskey from a decanter more than i used to <clears throat> i'm honestly not sure why um but in this one is some old Pultney hood art so a lighter smokier style of whiskey in that one is some glenmorangie milshorn um which i forgot i owned when i moved back in uh, to this house uh, my parents house i left most of my whiskey collection here and i found all these bottles that i honestly forgot about and three quarters of a bottle of milshorn was just sat there so i put it in a decanter because i was trying to clear out glasses and the smell on it is incredible it smells better in that decanter than it did for all the time i owned it just as a bottle and when i remember drinking it and trying it i don't think we ever reviewed it on whiskey wednesday <clears throat> but if any of our samples get delayed in the post because that is a possibility we have the option to review that amongst a few other things i've got dotted around here <clears throat> but i will say this stuff tastes incredible out of a decanter it's developed this rich honeyed slightly smoky lemony agave sweetness and it just smells incredible <clears throat> so for those of you who are still watching thank you um do you drink from decanters do you have decanters in your house um if you saw one uh, would you buy one is it something that you'd be interested in because i get asked about it a lot and my default answer was always just put big heavy sherried whiskies in them 
Glendron at 12, Glendron at 18, Glendronic in general, Abelor, McCallan, Dalmore, because not only does it look fantastic when you have this beautifully dark liquid, whether it's natural colour or not, in a decanter, it lures people, it makes people ask questions, which is good if you've got people around and you want them to try your whiskies. But, you know, the Old Pulteney is a, it's a peated cast finish, it's mainly bourbon influenced, I think it's all bourbon influenced. The Milchon is a sweet Portuguese wine finish. Oof, sorry, dinner's replaying on me there. But they, they both smell incredible, and they're both tasting incredible. Um, and I'm really loving drinking from decanters at the minute. I think something I'm going to move into in the future. I did have a really bad experience putting a bottle of Woodford Reserve in a decanter once. I'll never do that again. Um, might run an experiment just to see if my opinion has changed on that. But bourbon in decanters, I find, doesn't work. I've only tried it once, but it just put me off the whiskey in general. Um but Scotch whiskey, Irish whiskey and decanters, beautiful. I used to have Tullamore Dew 14 in that square decanter two houses ago. And it became like this coconutty, rich, over-the-top style. Um, it was delicious. For those of you that can hear my phone buzzing or moving, I apologise. It's set to vibrate and I've not turned notifications off. So that'll be just messages coming through. So apologies about that. Um, but we'll go back to the Glen Uri. Bit of water in it. Has it changed massively? Oh, the spice has come back. Maybe that's because it's settled. I don't know. But the spice on the nose has come back in a big way. We'll recap the history of both uh, before we close out, just to give everyone a con the construct, because that's what this whole thing is about. It's not just about watching me in a very badly wallpapered room with this plant, uh, just talking about things. So it's about the whiskies. It's about what we're here to do. So, final taste. Yeah, so even though the ABV came back, the, the taste without water is spicy and herbal. The taste with water is richer and significantly more decadent i think that's the world that the word i've been trying to pull out the air for sort of the last sort of 20 minutes honeys salted caramels bitter espresso bitter chocolate that was what it smelled like before water then you added water the flavors kind of went away it became more sherry just typical sherry but those flavors transferred onto the palate a very full a very rich style of whiskey um, something that if it was around today and still produced today, I would easily buy that. Um, so far, it's, if Glen Flagler was still around, I'd have a bottle of that all day. So that's really my cup of tea, that whiskey. It's light and fragrant and very bourbon influenced. Um, this Glen Uri Royal is delicious. I move away from sherry stuff all the time. I've, I've fallen and out of love with it more so than any other type of spirit in general in the world of drinks. Um, I was actually having a conversation with Joe, who used to run this channel uh, last night, or maybe the night before. And if I look around me, there's loads of whiskey here, there's whiskey there, there's whiskey over there, and there's whiskey there. Everything is either bourbon, or peated, or there's some sort of obscure Japanese stuff. There's loads of obscure bourbons underneath me here. Um, most of it cash strength, most of it quite intense. But none of it is sherried. That's a lie. Two of them are sherry. There's a Highland Park single barrel and a Glendronic single cask. That's it. Everything else is all ex American oak or has slight sherry influence, but is mainly bourbon influenced. Um, so that's kind of where my flavour profile sits. It's where it's always sat. Um, I do love sherry whiskies like Glendronic, the 12 in particular. Um, but a, a customer at one of our I think the last tasting we ran before the shop closed, temporarily, hopefully. Um, we put Glendronic 12 in a tasting, and it's always good to put it in a tasting event, because if you've never had it, or if you've had it a million times before, people love it. It's one of those whiskies where everyone tries it, and they're just like, that's great. Especially for the price, too. You can't really beat Glendronic 12 in most categories. Same with the 15, same with the 18. The 21, I, I'm not fond of, but that's just me. Um... 
And a customer said something, he went, is it good just because it's sherried? And my retort was, maybe just you're used to it, because when we have it in stock, we put it on every tasting, because it's lovely. Um, but I understood his point, and then when he, when we closed, and when I was just doing the paperwork on a Saturday night, I tried it again, and I was like, is it good just because it's heavily sherried? Is it different to other sherried products? Um, the answer was no, but it wasn't a bad thing. It was a case of it tastes as good as Macallan. It tastes as good as Abelor. I'd actually put it above the two of them personally, especially in value and um, the benefits you get from buying a bottle of Glendronic um, and the lack of narcissism which comes with owning a bottle of Glendronic too. Um, but I was thinking, you know, if it was in a bourbon cask, would it taste as good? So I have tried all bourbon cask Glendronic and it's something that is quite different. I've tried Peter Glendronic. That was quite fun. Um, but I'm kind of hoping they do an all bourbon cash release because I would be on that without a doubt. And they did a special release a couple of years ago. It was like a, they did a virgin oak bottle. They did a masala finish and they tasted delicious. They were really, really good whiskeys. Um, so yeah, to round that entire tangent off, I fall in and out of love with sherried stuff. But that Glenary Royal is stunning. Um, We've had this conversation before. Sample-wise, it's one of the more expensive samples you'll probably buy. It's just under about fifty pounds. It's about forty-seven quid. Um, I always go for the the signed shipping option just in case things go missing. So it's insured shipping, which comes to about fiver. So it's about fifty-two, fifty-three pounds. Um, but given that if you wanted to buy a full bottle of it, you'd be spending anywhere between nine hundred to a thousand pounds a bottle. I've no idea what the retail was when it first came out in in the early nineties. Um, totally worth it. Um, we tried Glen Esque last week. Cheaper by the Dram have a Glen Esque on their website. It's from the same bottling series as this, the Rare Malts, but it's called Hillside. That's about the same price as well. I think I will be buying one of those just because I want to know what cash strength Glen Esque tastes like now. This whole series has got me kind of wanting to try all these kind of really unusual, fun whiskies that aren't attainable that much anymore. Um, we're not scoring them. This is just like an overview of history. So we'll do those histories again. So starting with the Capadonic, 23 year old batch number six from the Boutique Whiskey Company. Make sure that doesn't slide into my laptop. 47.8%. The distillery was started in 1897 called Glen Grant number no. two. It only ran until 1902, a total of five years. And that was it as Glen Grant number no. two. And to get the whiskey to the Glen Grant distillery, they used to run a metal pipe over the road to send it there directly. One of the more unusual ways to get whiskey over the road to a distillery. Vattings. No one's ever really thought of that, I suppose, in the early 1890s. Um, from 1902 to 1965, the place was shut, reopened in 65 when it was called Capadonic, and was pretty much functional again up until 2010 when it was closed and then demolished. <clears throat> um, most people who reviewed it have called it not bad whiskey, but quite boring, a bit run of the mill. Um, which in the whiskey world for me is, is the worst thing you can be. This is not an it's not a cheap product to produce, despite what I might think of things like Proper Twelve or Hate Club. Uh, whiskey is not cheap to produce. It's not cheap to blend. It's not cheap to do anything with whiskey. It's all very expensive, and I think to go through the whole process of sourcing grain, milling it, turning it into a beer, turning it into a distillate, and aging it for at least three years in a day, let alone twenty three or forty. Um, to make something that's just run of the mill is a waste of your time and it's a waste of your staff's time. Um, it's not their fault, you know, it's just that the general whiskey community seems to view this distillery um, in the same bracket as things like Fetican and Tormor. That's not meant to be negative, it just seems to be a, a little bit of an overall view, um, which is quite consistent with a lot of people in this industry whose opinion I trust and who uh, have a trustful opinion in me as well. Um, for any of you that don't believe me, there's a Fetican 12 review uh, on this channel from last year. Um, and Jim Murray's opinions and a few other people's opinions on Fetican are quite well known to. Tormor too. Not tried that many Tormors, but it seems to fit into this category. Quite easy to drink. Not huge flavours. They don't jump out at you. Um, but it doesn't do anything that makes you remember it. And if something is not memorable, um, is it really worth your time? So in a few ways, we can maybe see why Capitonic eventually closed its doors in 2010. 
uh, before being closed for numerous times uh, and having another name for only five years in its first sort of uh, infancy. Glen Uri Royal, supplied by Cheaper by the Dram. From the Rare Malt series, distilled in 1971, bottled in 1994, 61%, all that good stuff, loads of sherry. Uh, started in 1825, arguably made whiskey up until about as an open distillery from 83 or 85, it depends whose opinions you believe. Let's just call it 83, because most things closed in 83. It was founded by a captain whose main claim to fame is that he walked a thousand miles in a thousand hours. I can walk faster than one mile an hour. I don't particularly want to walk a thousand miles, but if I have to, for some cool whiskey at the end of it, I will, and I'll probably do it in quicker than a thousand hours. Um... His one claim to fame. Luckily, his distillery made better whiskey than his achievements in life. Uh, opened in 1825. In 1968, its malting floor ceased, so it was sourcing malt from elsewhere, as most distillers are doing in the early 70s, late 60s. Uh, mothballed in 83 or 85. Barmies, do your own research, see whose opinion you believe. I'm just going to go with 83. And then ceased producing whiskey in general in the year I was born, in 1992. Um, this is great. This is... One of the coolest closed products I've tried. Uh, so rich, so lovely. If Alex is still watching this, um, this is very much up your street. Sadly, I'm not going to save you any because I don't know when I'll next see you for work in general. Hopefully less than two months. Uh, and I need to do a review on it uh, just for formality as well. Um, all of my tasting notes and everything for these last four whiskies I will publish on Instagram. I know that's not the best place to publish them because they only last for 24 hours as a story um if you do want to follow me on instagram it is not whiskey wednesday there is a whiskey wednesday instagram which was set up by joe years ago but i don't know the password neither does he and i don't want to start an instagram page from afresh because kind of pointless at this at this stage um so it's just my name uh p d w y e r p d y 92 search that you'll find me on instagram uh the notes for these I'll probably just publish as like a little story uh, tomorrow. So I'll fully review these tomorrow and then we'll get the tasting notes up. I've been trying to get a website started to have like an archive system because I found all these old tasting books and it'd be cool to just have everything archived. Currently working on that. Um, luckily I know some people who are quite good building websites. So hopefully we'll have that up and running mid-April, early May. And yeah, that, that's better for me. Ran over a little bit, 52 minutes in. Uh, star of the show today was Glenn Uri. Um, of the four we've tried, this is the star, to be honest with you. Really cool whiskey, really tasty. On its way is Milburn, Glen Oogie, Banff. Trying to get Convalmore, trying to get St. Magdalene, trying to get Lockside and Port Dundas and all these cool things. Um, but I'll be back here again at the same time next week, 7 o'clock on this channel. Um, we had seven people last week. We've got 14 currently, so that's good for me, right? We're only growing seven each time, so 21 next week and 28 the, the week after. Um, I'm going to go and play some guitar, so I will see you all next week. If you do have any questions, pop me a message on YouTube. I'm pretty sure I can still read them on there. Follow me on, on, on Instagram. is P-D-W-Y-E-R-9-2, P-D-Y-R-92. That's on Instagram. Whiskey Wednesday on Facebook or at Whiskey Tube. Uh, Twitter, same thing. Uh, but yeah, I hope you all have a, a very pleasant evening, and I'll see you next week, if not before end, if we reply to any messages from you. But have a stay safe, be comfortable. Um, as briefly mentioned earlier on in the video, this whole pandemic in the UK is starting. It, I think it peaks tomorrow. I think that's the peak point. Um, from a couple of solid bits of information I've heard. Um, so if you are thinking about going outside in the next couple of days, maybe don't. Maybe just stay in. Um, just for your own safety and other people's as well. But in the grand in the grand scheme of it all, do stay safe, and we'll see you all next week. Have a wonderful evening.